So, WFS3 in a nutshell. I'm gonna talk a bit ab about uh, WFS3 before I kill it. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, WFS3 was a sort of a very sharp change in OGC. It was the first specification that was uh, developed in the open from the beginning in a GitHub uh, repository using GitHub issues to discuss problems with the specification and move it forward. Um, it's based on resources and HTTP verbs. You could say RESTful, but OGC people don't like me to say that. Um, it's described by OpenAPI. Uh, so if you know Swagger and those tools, uh, you, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's JSON first instead of XML first, like all the specification. And the GeoJSON is the recommended output format, but it's not mandatory. Actually, there is no mandatory output format. Here is what it looks like in a Swagger editor. So you have a few resources, the landing page, which is the root, the conformance, which uh, tells you which uh, extensions have been implemented, the collections, which is the list of uh, feature types in, in, in WFS2. Uh, and uh, for each collection, you get a bit of metadata, and then you access the features via the items resource, and you can access a single uh, feature via items slash feature ID. It's pretty simple, pretty linear. But it's not called WFS3 anymore. How did we get, how did we get here? A bit of history. So this is the hist uh, uh, GitHub history of the commits in the repository. So as you, as you can see, it has been running for a while. And there has been a number of events that spurred more uh, activity. Uh, so at the beginning, it was developed uh, by a small group of people. Then we had the WFS3 hackathon and uh, lots of feedback with it because people started implementing prototypes. Then we had the testbed 14 and the vector ties pilot, which uh, all fed some, uh, backward, uh, some information backwards. Then we had the testbed 15 and the OG uh, API hackathon in uh, London. And uh, he around here, uh, the, um, the people working on the standard started to push for a final release. So what was the WFS3 hackathon? It was held uh, in um, somewhere in Colorado, um, Colorado Springs, I think, but I'm not sure. Um, and uh, uh, it was the first event in which uh, people tried to implement the protocol in various languages from scratch. The idea is that this WFS is so easy that you can implement a basic version of it in a, ma in a matter of days, okay, instead of a couple of months. Um, for me, it was the first exposure to WFS3. I participated the remote and implemented a, a WFS3 community module for GeoServer, which has been available since then as a, as a community module download. It was a very rough implementation because I had to do it in a couple of days, and GeoServer is very much based on uh, the older OGC protocols, so trying to adapt to uh, a RESTful interface was not easy. But uh, in a couple of days, I had something working, and uh, Evan Rual from uh, GWGR managed to run a client and extract features out of it through uh, OGR to OGR. Uh, so yeah, you can see that I, most of the commits were done in, uh, in a couple of days, and uh, these are the, uh, well, this is the GitHub page for the module. Uh, then we started participating in testbed 14. Testbeds are innovation programs. We uh, participate uh, with uh, these uh, uh, in these uh, events uh, for uh, for OGC for a few months. We have a certain objective to push the specification or an extension in a certain direction and try try things out, see if they works, uh, feed, provide feedback to the uh, SWIGs for uh, for um, sorry. Uh, to improve the specification. So in uh, testbed uh, 14, we uh, worked on uh, the site compliance. So while uh, Latlon was working on the site test to verify compliance of the standard with uh, uh, of, of a server, uh, GeoServer WFS3, LD Proxy, what WFS3, and Kubeworks at WFS3 were acting as the servers to be tested, and we basically bounced back and forth with the feedback oh, the t compliance test is not working, oh no, GeoServer is not respecting this or that part of the standard, and so on, until uh, the tests were passing for all three implementations, and, uh, well, that was the end of the activity. And uh, this is how GeoServer WFS3 got to pass the side tests, side tests which are beta, by the way. 
Uh, then we uh, worked on the vector tiles pilot. So the objective was to try out a Mapbox vector tiles uh, along with OGC protocols. And uh, since we were uh, at it, we worked on the new protocols. So we worked on some uh, experimental extensions to WFS3 that would just push, up, push out vector tiles on um, well-known uh, tile matrix sets. And along with that, since, well, you do vector tiles, you want to do client-side styling, we also added a style extension to WFS3 that would allow to associate styles with layers that the client could fetch as the default styles for that layer to, to use uh, on the client-side rendering. Then they can do whatever they want because they have the data, of course. But this would be a starting point. Um, and this is uh, our client running on a night style. Uh, so this was the day style. And we were running SLD styles on, on the, the client side. We tried the uh, SLD, we tried the Mapbox, we tried the GeoCSS, all running on the client side, painting the same vector tiles. So this is one example. This is the same vector tiles painted the client side and in, or using a night style instead. Then came the uh, API hackathon in London 2000, sorry, not 18, 19, it was uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, basically, uh, people involved try to apply the same principle as WFS3 to all other specifications. So features, coverages, maps and tiles, processes, catalogs, styles, and more. Uh, this resulted in an API commons, just like all the old uh, OGC services at OWS common as the base Common, common behavior. These ones will have an API commons specification on which all the others are based. And uh, well, it was a couple of days of going back and forth with uh, limits and problems and uh, new features that we wanted to have in, in, all, uh, in all the specs and also a bit of prototyping. During this hackathon, uh, I basically threw away the old WFS3 module because it was based on a number of hacks to make it quick to implement and uh, uh, prepared a new base for OGC APIs in general. So core, feature, styles, tiles, and uh, there will be more. So the idea is that I prepared a new base for implementation, which looks a lot like Spring MVC. It uses more or less the same annotations uh, with a few extras to make, uh, I don't know, HTML representations trivial to implement. Um, so this way, one can literally implement one class, which is the controller, which implements all the methods of the, the standard, or maybe have a separate class for an extension of the standard, and, uh, well, call the, the engines that which are below, which already do WFS. Um, so features, OGC IP features is back to being pure features. The style extension became a its own uh, standalone service to publish styles, but not just to publish them, also to manage them so you can modify them, you can delete them, you can create them from the client side, of course, if you have the rights to do so, and the uh, you know, GC API tiles, which is the WMTS replacement. So how do I fetch, fetch tiles from a server using the OGC API tiles? So what, that, what does a uh, OGC API look like? Well, um, you can find the specification for OGC API common at that uh, repository. Again, public, open, you can open issues if you don't like something and discuss with the authors. Uh, the idea is that, uh, well, it's basically the, the blueprint of WFS3. So slash is a landing page. Slash conformance tells you what extensions of the standard have been implemented or what output formats. Slash API gives you an API definition, typically an open API, but it's not mandatory. Uh, collections lists the collections that are published and depending on the service that you're trying to implement, collection means something slightly different. In, in features is the feature types. In maps, it's the layers. In, um, uh, WC, in coverages, it's the rasters and so on. And then you can access uh, the single collection uh, to get metadata. And the, the common part stops here. Then we have all the uh, single standards adding bits to it to do their job. But this is the common blueprint. In terms of encoding, the common blueprint says 
you should have, you, you can have an HTML representation for people to browse the API with using a browser inter interactively. And uh, all the uh, resources are encoded in JSON. If they happen to be features, you should be using GeoJSON. But none of these encodings is mandatory. Everything in these standards is free form. You can implement the standards using the same resources and encode them in some binary format of your making. It's still compliant. Maybe no client will be able to use it, but okay. But it's still compliant. Everything is interlinked. There are, there are links everywhere. So you can literally start from the landing page and follow links down to your data, your styles, whatever. So collections have backlinks to it themselves as the self-link, as uh, links to alternative representations in different formats. And then the collections link to collection ID. Uh, and this is more or less how it looks. It's a JSON object with an href, the link. The, the relationship, which could be self, alternate, data, item, whatever. Uh, the standards say what the relationship is depending on the context. The type, which more, more, most of the time is application JSON, but it could be something else. As I said, no format is mandatory. And then a title, which is well often um, uh, skipped, but it uh, just describes for uh, human beings what, what's inside the link. As I said, very little is mandatory. None of the encodings is mandatory. A server could, be, could do XML and, or protocol buffers and still be completely compliant. The API description itself, which is typically an open API document, is not mandatory. A client could just crawl links and still work. So it, it doesn't really need to have um, uh, an open API document to read. But it's nice to have it because if you have it, you can use a client generator to generate a basic version of your client to get started. Um, how does a client work then since nothing is mandatory and uh, everyone could, could implement stuff by, uh, in, in different ways? Well, the resources are more or less mandatory. It's the, the formats and the, the, what they can do that, uh, that is different. You go and, and look at the conformance uh, declaration, which is a, um, a set of URIs telling you what the server implements from the standards. So I get to know that this one implements core, open API 3.0, the HTML representation, and the GeoJSON representation. So from that, from that point, I can decide if I, as the client, can work with that server. Features API core. What does it add on top of the common? Well, the notion of items and uh, the access to the single item. The core is tiny. This is the basic assumption of every single uh, service. The, the, the core of the service is the minimum to make it work, and everything else is pushed out to extensions. So the only supported CRSs in core are CRS84 and T CRS84H, which adds uh, ellipsoidal, ellipsoidal yeah, height. Uh, there is no mandated schema. Features could literally be anything, simple, complex, heterogeneous, whatever. As long as you can represent them in the output, it's fine. Your server, of course, in, inside, it's, it's built for simple and complex features, so it, you would keep on uh, exposing them as, as they are, but uh, an implementation of the standard could literally throw you back features that have nothing in common with each other, and it would still be compliant. Uh, there are extra possible encodings, which are GMLSF0 and GMLSF2. They are both simple features, uh, but the SF0 is completely flat, is the simple features as GeoServer um, thinks of them. And GML SF2 allows non geometric properties to be nested, so you can have complex elements in the alphanumeric part of the feature. So for us, it's already complex features. But. Uh, slash API, it's not required to exist. Uh, if it exists, it's an open API document. And uh, uh, here comes uh, the, the first in interesting. Uh, design question. How do I model collections in this API? There are two approaches. The uniform collections in which in the API you just say collections slash collection ID. And uh, then you enumerate the, the possible collection IDs. If you do that, the collections have to be sort of uniform. You cannot specify anything peculiar to any, any collection because you are pushing them all in one container. The other approach, which was implemented by LD Proxy, is to have an, an endpoint for each one of them. And then you can uh, start saying, oh, yeah, 
this, fee, this uh, collection has these attributes in output because you can specify a schema for it, for example. This gets very long, very verbose if you have many, many collections. So we haven't implemented it in GeoServer. It could be implemented, pending funding. Uh, access to the items. Uh, it just gives you the, the contents of the collection. You can filter, yes, but only by on bounding box and date time. Th those are the two basic filters. And any extra query parameter that you declared in the a API document. So if in the API document you said that there is a Mickey Mouse parameter that has three possible values, you can use it as a filter in the query parameters. Paging, yes, paging is there. Uh, limit is the, uh, another query parameter that you can use for paging. Paging uh, is implemented by links. You have links, uh, prev, self, next, that tells you the previous page, the next page, and this allows you to implement paging whatever way you want. GeoServer uses an offset parameter, but it's just a possible way to implement it. So this allows for random paging, but uh, if you were to implement on Elasticsearch, you, you would have uh, uh, something else that uh, doesn't allow for random paging. And that's all, that's all. This is the uh, WFS3 core period. This is all it can do, which is not much, honestly. So what about SQL, query, joins, store queries, property selection, transaction, and so on? The standard will have extensions that a server can implement or not in, in an approach similar to GeoPackage. Right now, there is no official extension. There is one in the making, which is the coordinate reference system extension, which will allow for reprojection and uh, to query bounding boxes in, in different uh, coordinate reference systems. And then during testbed 14, some groups have prototype filtering via CQL, uh, stored queries, geometry simplifications, and so on. You can follow this link to get to the engineering report. But these are not to be confused with specs. They are just experiments. Okay. None of them is official or final. So right now, at, at this very moment, all we have is core. What does it look in GeoServer? Well, uh, when you plug in the OGC API module, you get uh, along the service capabilities also the la links to the landing pages. The landing page for uh, features gives you the links to API collections and uh, well, that's all. Uh, if you look at the API, you get a Swagger UI uh, implementation that shows you the API. Uh, if you look at the collections, you get a list of the collection with the minimal metadata, title, geographic extents, and then access to data as HTML or the other supported formats. If you look at a single collection, you still get links to uh, the items and a feature schema representation. And if you go to the items, well, you get a page table. Uh, uh, as you can see, everything is really, really bare in the, in the HTML representation. The standard doesn't say anything about what you should put in the HTML representation. I made a very basic uh, implementation. I hope that someone will pop in and make it pretty or more useful. One minute integration, uh, introduction to uh, the styles. Yep, styles and tiles API. Styles are, well, Collections of styles, there's no collections, there's styles. Each style has uh, metadata and it can be extracted in one or more formats. Some servers implement only one format, other servers have, have a built-in engine to convert between formats and allow you to extract in multiple formats. Uh, this is the page for the style, uh, for the single style. Uh, you can see that you have the list of layers in the style. Some styles can have multiple layers inside. For each layer, it will tell you what attributes that the style uses so that you can tell if your data set is compatible with the style. Uh, we are making a Styles API client, which is a, a visual style editor. One of the objectives of st Testbed 15 is to make a visual style editor. And this client uses Mapbox Vector Tiles for rendering, and uh, you can point and click your way to edit the style and save it back on the server. Tiles, tiles are interesting. Most of these tiles, style matrix set ID, blah, 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 they are more or less what you would expect from a WMTS RESTful impl implementation. So you get the grid, the Z, the, the, the Z level, the row, the column, and so on. Uh, you might have row tiles, which have no style information because you are getting out data, like MVT, or they can have a, a style, and then they are render tiles, so PNGs and JPEGs. Or you can have no, nothing at all and everything in the query parameters, and then you can combine tiles for multiple layers. 
and uh, all the parameters are in the query in the query section. The interesting part is that that structure can be plugged in different places. It can be plugged in the root, and then I can uh, get tiles from multiple collections. It can be plugged into the map service implementation, and then I'm tiling a map. It can be plugged into a collection, and then I'm getting vector tiles out of it. It can be plugged into a coverage or whatever. I mean, this is a generic mechanism to extract tiles. As long as your resource can be tiled, you can plug those extra uh, URL elements, and you will get a compliant tiles API. And that's it. Okay, we have uh, four or so minutes for questions. Uh, raise your hand, we'll pass the microphone around. Um, uh, regarding the description and the self-description of links, uh, are you using any sort of quite standard like HAL for the hypermedia? Because the, the record it describes also the descendant resources. This is a, a sort of hypermedia. If we are looking for REST, then uh, yes. This is uh, is quite conform on the spring uh, use of the HAL hypermedia, but it's, it's, it's quite close to. So I'm just an implementer. I'm not uh, part of the specification uh, yeah. team. So I don't know the answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> there was a question over here. Well, another question about the implementation, which uh, you have nothing to do about. But uh, why are you using colons instead of equal signs in the query string? It says limit colon 50 instead oh, of... Oh, that was probably a mistake. Uh, either right. in, in the right. copy-paste when I prepared the slide. No, it, it, ah. it's meant to be an equal. Okay, and the second question is, um, like if you're implementing this, um, does collections have to be on the root or could you just move it down uh, like on the sub-path? Uh, they, they can be as down as you want. Ah, so okay. the, the landing page is your, let's say, root, but it can be anywhere in your path. So it could be that you are your own organization of the landing pages. So for example, LD proxy has a notion of data sets, and for each data set, it gives you a separate landing page. For GeoServer, the idea is that we will have a landing page for each workspace. Any more questions? Questions, anyone? Well, good. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you all very much.